it's it's a great honor to be here. My name is Arudas Grishnas. I'm a Fulbright fellow here at, uh, at the Baltic Studies uh, program, and uh, uh, we've gathered today to commemorate uh, the passing of uh, Leonidas Donskis. It's the seventh anniversary. Uh, what kind of a person he was, I, I'm pretty sure we will hear fairly, fairly soon. Uh, I would just like to say a, a few words uh, a, a few words uh, regarding the housekeeping so first we will have this conversation about Leonidas about his personality about his his work uh, and then I, I understand that Timothy and 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 uh, Bradley will have to uh, leave uh, early but I would ask you to stay for the second part the discussion and a seminar uh, type of discussion uh, where we will read uh, an excerpt from uh, Leonidas Donsky's uh, uh, text and uh, hopefully have a very interesting conversation. Uh, this event is recorded, is being recorded. Uh, there are at least a couple of people plan it, they were uh, planning to, to join us online. Uh, so to those online, uh, we can read your comments if you if you will have if you will want to participate in in the conversation, the, in the discussion, uh, you can you can use use the the Zoom chat to uh, to share your comments. Uh, I would also like to ask to to thank uh, Baltic News Services for for providing one of the pictures that you can uh, can see uh, in the uh, event advertisement, but also. Uh, 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 Leonidas' uh, friend Tamar Gendler, who kindly shared some pictures, uh, and uh, as well as uh, Leonidas' wife, Yolanta uh, Donskene, who also sent us a greeting letter, which she asked me to read. So uh, before starting all this, I would really like to quickly read the letter. So she writes, uh, dear guests, welcome to this discussion. I'm delighted that this event is taking place. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers of the initiative as well as all of the attendees here today for this wonderful idea to make the ideas and conversations of my late husband, Leonidas, come to life once more, this time in the US context. I apologize for not being able to be with you tonight, uh, but know in my heart that the spirit of the discussion would, uh, would have made Leonidas proud. I wish you, you a productive and fascinating discussion today. All the best from Lithuania. So with these words, I pass the microphone to Bradley. Thank you, Arvidas. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for including me in, in this event. Uh, I'm Bradley Woodworth, I'm the program manager of the Baltic Studies program. And it's to thank to people like uh, Arvidas that we've been able to, and others, uh, expand the events uh, in the program over this last year. Leonid Dostoevskis was a Lithuanian philosopher, writer, Teacher. He was a professor in the Department of Political Science at Vitalis Magnus Magnus University in Kaunas, Lithuania. You're a public figure and towards the latter years of his life, also a politician. From 2009 to 2014, he was a member of the European Parliament. Um, the party he was selected from, and he was there was only one uh, European parliamentarian from this party, Liberal uh, Sayudis is a party that sought to appeal to all Lithuanian people who cherish transparency and democratic governance and are united by liberal ideas. Uh, ideas that I think will come out in the discussion here today. Leonidas Donskis died unexpectedly, tragically from a heart attack in September, 2016. I met Leonidas Donskis once in Tallinn, Estonia in the early 2000s. He and a Philosopher friend of mine, Thirubi, who is now rector of Tallinn University, uh, walked about Upper Tallinn, der Domberg, um, in, in the old Baltic German sense, and they talked philosophy while I listened. I heard him speak again in Kaunas in 2009 before, this time, an audience of several hundred who were intently listening to him um, at a conference of Baltic studies. Uh, and he had just been elected to the European Parliament and was sharing his concerns as I recall his trepidation about leaving Lithuania for an indeterminate period of time and about a big change in his life. I don't recall that well, unfortunately, his remarks, but both times I heard him speak in person, he clearly left with me the sense, and I take these words from one of the section titles of this new collection of his late writings, which you see here on the table, 
Uh, one of the section titles is, is Mus Griona Magie Bananos Delicae, which means it is small, banal things that threaten to destroy us. He left that impression with me that that was the kind of person he was, someone that always bore that in mind and did, of course, just the opposite. This first section of today's memorial event we are calling In Memoriam. Uh, the speakers will be Professor Timothy Snyder, the Richard C. Levin Professor of History here at Yale University, then Professor Marcy Shore, who teaches intellectual history uh, here at Yale, and then Diktaras Bakhmetyevs, one of our Baltic Studies uh, postdoctoral associates uh, this semester, a colleague of Leonid Dostonskis, who teaches philosophy at Vitaldus Magnus University of Gomes. Victoras is also a faculty member at the Paris Institute for Critical Thinking. We thank all of you, all three of you for coming. And um, so Professor Snyder, I'll turn this to you. Oh, okay, I'm first, all right, <laughs> good. Um, very nice to see you. It's very good for to, to see people coming out for a conversation. Um, uh, Leonidas was um, Leonidas was a, a prolific, um, and, uh, prolific and important writer. I would venture to say that he was better in conversation than he was on the page, and in that sense, I am happy to be able to remember mm -hmm. him in, in in this way. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing from from others and treating this as a as, as a conversation. So I. I, I met I, I met Leonidas on a stage, um, a bit like this one, except a lot bigger and hundreds of people in front of us. Mm -hmm. When I was presenting in public for the first time the basic scheme of my argument for the book Bloodlands, this was in Vilnius in 2009. I think it's fair to say that there was not a person in that audience who was prepared for what I had to say. Um, great discomfort and much discussion um, arose. What I remember was that Leonidas, who I had not met before and whom I did not know personally, was the moderator of this, of this discussion. He did a wonderful job um, and he was extremely personable. And, and afterwards he said to me, and not for the first time, he said, he said this about the book afterwards as well. He said, you know, I think you, you've got it basically right. You know, you've got it basically right. <laughs> you know, which, was, which, was very, which was very reassuring um, because it's, um, it's a, it, it was a book which had something to displease everybody and, you know, and did. But the attempt was to try to get the whole correct. Um, that, that was a book, of, for those of you who don't know, it was a book about the 30s and 40s in Eastern Europe and all of the policies of Nazi coming, the, the Soviet as well as, as the German. And the thesis was that Lithuania, along with Belarus, Poland, and Ukraine belong to a, a, a special zone which we had to take seriously. Uh, I think now, when I think of Leonidas, I think of him among the people whom I miss the most during this war. You know, there are a lot of people whom I miss during this war, but only but, but a few special ones who I knew who I knew well uh, and 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 whose whose specific kind of input at this time would be welcome and I think is we we we, we miss. Tony Judd is one of them. Um, Leonidas is certainly another. And there are specific reasons for this. Like it's not, it's not just that these are smart people who I like and who would have things to say, and it'd be nice to have them around. It's that the texture of their work provides the specific thing that I think we're, we're missing. I, I think of this war as being an example of the, the, an example, an instance, but also a consequence of this general atmosphere that we have where Words and ideas mean ever less all the time. Where we're we're racing, we're racing downwards to to a state where it's harder and harder to get purchase on anyone else's mind at any time with anything that you say or write, because everyone's mind is being constantly deconstructed and, and disintegrated and separated out, you know, into this into this digital world. Which, ironically, for everyone who expected technology to make us wiser, this digital world, which is actually let's be frank, making everyone stupider and not just stupider, but more, but more totalitarian. Like it's as though the world that we're in now is set up to make us more vulnerable to the kinds of things which you know, the authors of totalitarian uh, dystopian texts were afraid of. What I, what I wanted to talk about is, um, so what I mean is that Leonidas held things up. Leonidas 
was he was he was like he was like Isaiah Berlin, who was someone who figures in a number of his texts, in that he read everything. He was un he was unlike Isaiah Berlin in that he read the things that were written while Isaiah Berlin was alive, whereas Isaiah Berlin read the things that were written while you know before Isaiah Berlin was alive. Leonidas read the things from the 20th century that were written while Isaiah Berlin was in fact alive, and he was a kind of referee, an incredibly competent and fluent referee of all sorts of things from film to novel to philosophy to political thought um, <coughs> not only the 20th century but it was interesting that he kept up with the, the 20th century and, and into the 21st and he the, the texture of what he did was to remind us that not just that the, these things matter but to show us how they do matter to show us how the thoughts of other people can make us more wise in an everyday sort of sense and provide us with some kind of bulwark some kind of purchase some kind of friction that allows us to stand where we are and actually process the things that are going on around us so it's it's that it's that way in general that i miss that i miss Leonidas. i um i decided to what I wanted to talk about very, very briefly as an example of this, um, I, br I brought a book that Leonidas, I'm pretty sure, gave me on that stage in Vilnius um, in 2009. That's what the dedication says. And, and in this text, there are, a couple of, there, there are a couple of essays towards the end where he makes a very characteristic kind of argument, which I, which I like very much. It's about, he's, he's, looking, he's looking for conservatism. Um, where you know he's looking for conservatism in all the right places, I would say to you know to terribly paraphrase the country music song. Um, he's um, he, he's uh, he, the two essays are about the dystopian texts of the twenty of the twentieth century, and the point that Leonidas is making is that the authors of these texts, Zamyatin, Orwell, um, the, uh, that that they themselves are in some way left wing, but they're, but their being radical or being liberal wasn't actually enough for them to reconstruct what a dystopia would look like. In order to do that, they also had to be conservative. Conservative in the sense that the thing that is violated by over-rationalistic technocracy, which pushes the logic to the end, is this thing called everyday life, which we don't really love, right? Love, family, and friendship, the things that you're actually attached to. And that in the center and on the left, we don't really have the equipment to describe those things very well. And so in that sense, he argues Orwell was a conservative, right? In that, in that very specific sense, Orwell had to be a conservative. And that's a, that's, a, that's a kind of, you know, unexpected dialectical, also very convincing argument, um, which is itself quite human because it sort of proves the point that it's, it's proves the point that it's trying to make by capturing something about, or about Orwell personally which maybe not is on the surface of the text, you know, which I think is true about, about, about Orwell, about Orwell personally. So this is, I, I just happened to, I happened to read these texts because Marcy had recovered this book and had it on her, had it on her desk. And this happens to be the book that, 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 that Lydia just gave, it, gave me when, when we met. So I've taken some specific pleasure in reading it last night and, and catching up with these, with these two essays. And although I say that maybe this was better in person than in writing, it was really, really very good in writing. And I will also be writing an essay about these two essays because I promised to do so. And that will be another way to remember leaving this. But for the time being, I'm really glad to be able to be with you in person and to start the discussion. Thank you. Well, first, yeah, thank you to Arvidas and Brad for organizing this. Um, it's really very serendipitous sectors can be here. Um, just really, really so you, you should speak up a little bit. Oh, okay. So there oh, are sorry. people on, the, on Zoom. Oh, that's right. There are no microphones. Yeah. There. Yes. There are also, there are should, should we use a microphone though? Is there? No. It's all. I'll, I'll try to project. My voice doesn't project very well. I usually, when I teach, have a microphone. But let me. Um, I will try. You should, to. You should give her a microphone. You happen to have a microphone. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if it's good enough, like, it may or may not be working. It might not be, yeah. It is working. I think we should do the thing. <laughs> like, uh, okay, uh, how about we try speaking in, in natural voice? Yeah, and if, if, yeah if, I will. If the microphone raises us, then it's yeah, Tim's voice card is much better than mine does. Um, no, I'm very grateful to all of you for being here. Um, 
and re remembering something, somebody, and something that he gave us that is severely lacking that we all miss very much today. I also, at that same conference in Vilnius, that was the first time I heard Leonida speak in person. Um, and like Tim, I would say he was more magical in person. He writes the way he speaks. So there's a bit of a stream of consciousness to it. And he's wonderfully performative as a speaker. He has a theater background, if I recall. He was both a musician and he had a theater background. And he loved being with people. And he loved talking with people. Um, and he was able to think in real time. You know, he was always thinking aloud with the people with whom he was talking, you know, which is one of the reasons why there should be discussions involving him and about him, because he liked to have everybody together thinking aloud in real time and not just people reading pre-prepared text in a kind of monological fashion. Um, he had an, I mean, he had almost kind of graphomaniac sensibility, which was so much for me a part of you know what had ensorcelled me about East European intellectual life when I first came there. And as Tim said, this extraordinarily capacious set of references. The just the sheer amount of reading seems to have been you know too much for one person in one lifetime. I suspect he must have been a speed reader. He must have been one of those people who has the ability to consume enormous amounts of literature in multiple languages because just the just the sheer diversity of those references. And he wasn't there to name drop them. He was thinking with all those people. You know, everything that was coming into his head was giving him ideas in almost kind of manic fashion. So, you know, there was like, there was Chekhov, you know, and there was Zanyatin, you know, and there was Shakespeare, you know, and they were, you know, there was the latest film that he saw, you know, and they were all there, you know, they were all, there was like the person he talked to last week and, you know, there was the Beatles and like, it was all there. There was a kind of radical cosmopolitanism to it. Um, and Leonidas came to Krasnogruda when we were in Krasnogruda, I think it was 2013, when he was preparing to, you know, retire from the European parliament. You know, and as part of what his decision to leave European politics in a formal sense and to go back to academia, he had plans to create a kind of institute for advanced study in Vilnius. Um, which, <coughs> okay, an institute for advanced study in Kalinius, which he envisioned as a kind of radically cosmopolitan project. You know, and he wanted he wanted us and all sorts of other people he knew from all over in all other languages. <laughs> You know, coming and hanging out there, you know, and talking to talking to students and talking to scholars, but also talking to human rights activists and talking to journalists. Um, and he was so he was so full. He and Yolanda were so full of plans. You know, they were always thinking about what could be done. You know, and they liked to be around people, and they were looking to the next generation. And I remember we were sitting and uh, drinking coffee with Krzysztof Czajewski and Malgosia, and there was a moment where you said to me, "Like this is it, the world cosmopolitan conspiracy, <laughs> right here, you know, plotting about the institute in Kaladesh, where intellectuals are going to get together and think of ideas and try to brainstorm ways to save the world." Um, I was in Belgrade in September two thousand sixteen. Um, when the news came of Leonidas' death. And I was, I was not, I didn't just happen to be in Belgrade. I was in Belgrade for a meeting of the um, Moscow School of Civic Education, as people Victor also knows. Um, and it was in the aftermath of the Maidan. And this was a, a school started by two philosophers who were part of a circle around Mirab Marmardashvili in the Soviet period, you know, and who in 1991 with the fall of the Soviet Union, you know, had created a kind of a, a school that would run intensive week-long seminars for journalists, for teachers, for policy people, for NGO activists, for human rights activists, you know, and it was this enlightenment Kantian model, dare to know, you know, have the courage to use your own understanding. We're coming out of the Soviet period, we're going to teach people to think. Um, and that was, you know, 
that was going, you know, in Russia until they were declared foreign agents with the Maidan. And then after 2014, they had to meet in different places. Um, but Russians were still coming. They were taking a risk, but they were coming to meet different places. And in this case, there was this week long seminar in Belgrade. And so I was in Belgrade um, with you know, a group of largely Russians, um, some Ukrainians, some Belarusians. Um, everyone knew that, you know, there must be an informer or two among them. So people were kind of nervous about talking. Um, Elena Nemirovskaya and Yuri Senokovsu, who were the, the two philosophers who began this, who were born in the Stalinist period, um, were very devoted, you know, and determined that they would fight to the very end. And I was, I was there, you know, reading the news and having the messages in my hotel room when the news came of Leonidas's death. And I remember going downstairs to the cafe and telling telling Elena Nemirovskaya that Leonidas had died. And she gave me this look that was a look of such, of such kind of devastation in a sense, not just a sense of you know, somebody she liked personally and would miss, but in the sense of look where we are and how few of us there are fighting this fight and, and they can't. We can't afford to lose them. Like, I mean, she just she gave me this look and she stared and then she she couldn't say anything. Like she couldn't talk. Um, and then I felt guilty about telling her, although of course she would have found out momentarily anyway. It's not the kind of news one can really conceal. Um, and then Krzysztof Chizewski was um, our, our Polish friend um, who runs the Borderlands Foundation in Krasnogruda. Uh, which is another kind of rootless cosmopolitan or rooted cosmopolitan in this case um, venture was in Italy at the time, and he he wrote to me, and he said I'm you know I'm headed back right now to Lithuania for the funeral. Um, I'm writing a eulogy. Can you help me with the translation from Polish? So that's this is the text that I I want to read in a, a few minutes, which is the eulogy that Krzysztof wrote on the way from Italy to Lithuania, having just gotten this news and we were texting back and forth. I was working on the English translation of this. Um, the, the last time before that I had seen Leonidas was also in Krasnogruda that just a month or so earlier, you know, it, when he and Yolanda were both there and seemed well, um, you know, not like, you know, get up every morning and, you know, run 10K well, but still pretty well, you know, for Central European intellectuals well. Um, <laughs> he was teaching at this um, joint seminar we were running with some colleagues from Poland, Ukraine, Lithuania called Chitani Drugego, reading the other. Um, and I remember he gave a wonderful improvised talk about utopia and he used the phrase ontological junk food, um, that um, a current brand of postmodernism was kind of currently feeding people, an ontological junk food always stuck in my mind. Um, and he was, the students loved him. Uh, he was one of, these were mostly students whose, everyone was functioning in English, a lot of them had much better Russian than English, but the, you know, the, the mood of the moment was that everyone was functioning in English. And Leonidas is, was unique in some sense or on that, just on that cusp of that generation that he was one of the few people I knew who were real Central European intellectuals rooted in their own native language, their own tradition, their own literature, also in Jewish Eastern Europe. Um, who were equally comfortable and adept in Russian and English, who really were cultural mediators, who could effortlessly go back and forth and cross all those borders, you know, in a way very few people could do. There was going to be a younger generation who would be able to do that in English, and there was an older generation who could do that in Russian, but Leonidas could do it in both languages, and he could do it with the cultural expansiveness of knowing all those references, of having spent lots of time in both places, you know, and he would very excitedly talk and brainstorm in whatever language he was talking in, and one of the students at that seminar was a young student from, from Kiev who I had done a long interview with for my book about his his time on the Maidan. He had been fighting on the Maidan and he wasn't, he didn't look like a fighter. You know, he looked like he was 
he, he looked like he was kind of thin and bookish and somebody who spent a lot of time in the library and maybe didn't quite get enough sunlight. And, and he fought incredibly bravely on the Maidan um, and you know, thought he would be killed, but survived and was still kind of recovering from that. But also it had thrown him into intense involvement in human rights work, in trying to help people coming from the Donbass, you know, in continually traveling east and getting involved in the war. And I, you know, I, I wanted to introduce him to Leonidas, who was also working on these human rights issues connected to Russia and Ukraine. You know, and Misha was a little bit intimidated, you know, and I said, no, this is like, this is an occasion. You know, it's an occasion to have you know, to have a chance to have the time and attention of a person like this that you normally don't get. So like, let me like, let me do this for you. And so I, you know, I asked Leonidas like during a coffee break, I'm like, I really want you to talk to Misha. He's had some very special experiences, you know, and he's young, but he's understood a lot, you know, and there's a lot he's going to be able to do, you know, and Leonidas, you know, immediately starts very enthusiastically talking about this or that. And Misha's English was, was nascent. You know, Misha was kind of struggling to keep up in, in English. And I remember thinking like, should I risk embarrassing him by asking Leonidas to switch to Russian um, or should I just let it go? And I stood there for a moment or two. And then I had this thought was that there just aren't going to be that many occasions in a young student's life that he gets the time and attention of somebody like this. And this is really something special for him. And we probably shouldn't use it on practicing his English. Like there's a pro like we should probably use it on like they're having the best conversation they can. And I remember thinking like, okay, there'll be other occasions, but this is a specific inter occasion. And I, I just, I think I tapped Leonidas in the shoulder and I said, can we switch to Russian? Which of course effortlessly he did without like missing a beat and just continued the whole stream of like various ideas he had about what was wrong in the world and how one might go about saving it. Um, but later I was haunted by that because that was just a month before he died. And I had this thought that maybe there won't be that many occasions, but I didn't think this was going to be the very last one. Um, maybe the um, last thing I'll say before I was, I was looking back at uh, an essay I had I had written for years ago after his death about him and some of the writing he had done about Russian journalists who had taken great risk to expose truths about Putin's Russia. And one of the things I was looking at there, which did not have, which I wrote about, but it didn't have the same poignancy then that it does now, was that he was somebody who was so steeped in Russian literature who had all of that in his head. And that did nothing to kind of, to cloud the evil that was happening there. On the contrary, it made him more hypersensitive to it. Like all of what he took from all of that history and all of that learning and all of that literature and all of that philosophy, that, that was all mobilized into a critical sensibility and not an apologist sensibility. You know, and that strikes me as kind of, you know, particularly important example to think about at the moment. I, I did have this thought, and the last thing I'll say, then maybe after Victor's talks, I can read just us eulogy, that you know, he died in September 2016. He was very attached to the United States. He had spent a lot of time here. This was not a foreign place to him. And when Trump won the election in 2016, I had this thought was that at least he didn't have to, at least he didn't have to see this. And then in February, 2022, I felt that way, but still more so. I thought at least he didn't have to see this. Um, but good for him, but bad for us because he is exactly the voice. He is exactly the voice that we need right now, kind of at, at this moment. So maybe we can kind of you know, evoke his spirit a little bit here today. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, hello, everyone. It's a it's a pleasure to be here. Of course, and, uh, to share <clears throat> some of my memories uh, about Lord Uh While preparing for this, I I I try to remember when I first met him, and uh, uh, I actually forgot. But it's it was in 1994. <laughs> I was 14 years old 
and I just read it was summer, and I just read uh, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, and it made me a little bit depressed. I have to <laughs> so I was lying there in my in my room in my bed, basically thinking there's no point in continuing. <laughs> and after a few days like this, uh, my mother opened the door and she said, "That's it. You're going to a summer camp. You're not lying anymore." <laughs> and I said, I'm, I'm not going. I'm 14 years old. I've done this before. It's for children. She said, no, no, you're going. And so she sent me off to this uh, strange summer camp by the sea near, near Klaipeda in, in Lithuania. And I've been before to summer camps, to also pioneer camps, etc. And I thought mostly it was quasi-military endeavor. And I thought this is going to be like this. And when I came there, uh, they assigned me to my age group, and the tutors of my age group were uh, these two guys. One turned out to be a philosopher, Leonidas Donskis, and the other was uh, an actor from National Theatre in Vilnius, Danis Kozlowskis. And it turned out this is a very special summer camp. They hired <laughs> these really unique uh, people who would spend their summers tutoring kids. And so uh, that was the first time I met uh, Leonidas. Next summer, I actually paid myself out of my money to go there. <laughs> my mother didn't have to, to send me. But uh, that was the, so for, just to give you an example of what they used to do, I remember the first meeting we had when I never heard of him before. Uh, uh, and he said, uh, Leonidas said, uh, I'm trying to convince the, the head of the camp to, to switch off this uh, kind of military signal, which would say that everyone has to get up at eight o'clock in the morning. He said, I'm trying to convince him to, to switch it off because it's, it's really disgusting. It's almost like, you know, like a military camp. But he says, the, the, the guy refuses. So he says, what we do in our group with this actor, we go in each room every morning and we sing songs to you. So that's what they would do. Every morning you wake up and there's Donskis and Kozlowska. Donskis <laughs> And they sing in Yellow Submarine and, and other songs like Beatles. That's what they used to do. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's my first memory of Leonidas. And, and then next I met him of course, already as a, as a graduate student at Vito das Magnus. He came back to Lithuania and he started teaching there. And um, I took his classes as, as, a select, as selected because I wanted to, to, to listen to him. And it was something unique at the time in Lithuania because what he did was uh, yeah uh, kind of comparative history of ideas and that was the first time where I would listen about the cultural history of Lithuania situated in the region that's what we didn't do at all before normally we would tell ourselves a story that we are unique Lithuanian uh, history is unique Chosen by God or not chosen by God is <laughs> arbitrary, but, but it, it's definitely unique and it, there are no parallels. And of course, uh, Donsky's approach was completely different. That actually there's, there's much more that connects us to others than, than we know. And so he, in that sense, he was a, a bridge builder for sure. Uh, afterwards, uh, I became a colleague and I started teaching as a, as a young philosopher in, in Vito das Magnus, but also we, he very, as it was mentioned, very, uh, when I started teaching, he left for European Parliament and, and then uh, after five years came back. So I, I cannot say that I ever became uh, friends with him. I was more of an observer. And I think uh, it's fair to say that in last 13, 15 years of his life uh, in Lithuanian public sphere, he was the philosopher. The philosopher in the sense that when you, in Lithuania, outside of academia, in general public, you would mention philosophy, Donskis would be the name which pops up. He would be the, the figure of what philosopher is. And um, while preparing for this, I was thinking before him, that kind of figure was another prominent Lithuanian philosopher, Arvind Schlogeris, who died um, also recently in 2019. And 
And uh, so in the 90s, let's say, if you would talk philosophy in general public, it would be Schlagers. Everyone would say, oh, this guy Schlagers. Did you hear what he said? And after 2003, 2004, I think that figure becomes Donskis. There are many reasons for that. I think the most uh, um, uh, the reason which has the most weight is that he had a, a TV program on a national TV, a, a talk show, a weekly talk show where he would talk to figures which were of interest to him, mostly intellectuals, but not only. He would talk to, let's say, Arda Sabonis, who's a bad basketball star. He would talk to mm -hmm. pop musicians. But of course, it was Donsky, so it would always become a really interesting conversation. In, in that sense, uh, Donsky was in parallel. And also, he was a, 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 a columnist, a weekly columnist, uh, on uh, uh, number one news portal. So basically, he's a, not just a public figure. He's really, really famous. He's really famous, so if you ask a philosopher, that's him. And I was thinking about this, these two figures, Schlagers and Donskis, and in almost like dialectical, kind of quasi-Hegelian logic, but they're polar opposites. They're polar opposites. So Schlagers is, is really like Lithuanian, Lithuanian, Lithuanian. He, he is born somewhere in Panevejis. He loves his, where he's from. He constantly talks about the Lithuanian countryside. He loves the Lithuanian language. That's that's his means of thinking. Uh, uh, Donsk is, is, of course, yes, he's Lithuanian, but also he's Jewish. He's Jewish, and that's important to him. Also, it's important to the public in the public sphere. Uh, and uh, he's uh, not just Lithuanian Jewish, but I think it's fair to say he lives in the world. So Lithuania for him is he lives in, first of all, not in the countryside, but mm -hmm. in the city. And that city is not in Lithuania per se, but it's somewhere in Europe. Mm -hmm. And even when in the latter stages of his life, when he, he starts living in Shetani, in, uh, which is a countryside in Lithuania, I think he cho chooses that because it's close to Milos. That's, <laughs> that's Milos's birthplace. And so for him, it's, again, it's a connection not to go somewhere where there's, you know, grass and cows and, <laughs> and some beautiful river. He loved that. But I think he lives in the world as opposed to in the little homestead. Um, they also have completely contrasting approaches to language. <clears throat> Schlager is language, is, he is influenced by Heidegger, of course. It, language is, is a struggle and an obstacle, and an obstacle to things. While for, for Donskis, of course, language is, is, a, is, is a means of conversation, it's a bridge, it's a dialogue. He, he speaks always because he needs to understand, he needs to make a connection. So completely different. He's very, uh, anyone who, who, who listened to him ever, is, is very rhetorically charged. I don't know if that's the correct <laughs> phrase, but he's, he's very, he loves, the, he loves talking. He, he's, he's kind of, he's flourishing. In that. I remember one public uh, discussion, uh, which young, young Lithuanian philosophers organized, and there were three guys, of course, Lithuanian philosopher. So one guy speaks, another guy speaks, and then Donsky. And Donsky says, sorry, I can't, I can't talk sitting down. So he stands up because he, he has to, he, he's, he's so, for him, it's very important the way he presents himself, the way he presents the thought. It's, uh, in that sense, uh, language, language has to work for him. Uh, Schlogers is metaphysical. He talks about cosmos. He talks about space. What Donsky brings is political. He's political and cultural. He talks, he, that's why he's not afraid to kind of become politician himself. He's not above that. Like normally before that, and I think it comes a lot from Russian, I would say intellectual tradition, say Brodsky is like that. Politics is just, you know, this dirt and I'm, I'm above it. I'm, I talk with gods, you know, because I'm <laughs> one of them, something like that. Donsky is much more down to earth, if you will. And, uh, and uh, another thing which is, is related to that is that uh, approach to time. I think Schlogers and this tradition, which we had before they are, they are above time too. They're timeless. They work somewhere. Uh, you know, Schlogers always talks, you know, I'm, 
I'm spoiled by good texts. And good texts are, of course, those texts, Plato. Yeah. And that's it. That's Plato, maybe yeah. Aristotle. But these are the guys. And then, okay, there are some contemporary, but Schlager is famously, when he, in the 90s, when the borders opened, he, was, he, he went to the US. Uh, it was organized by, I think, some American Lithuanian intellectuals here. And he, fam he came back and famously proclaimed that philosophy in the West is dead. That's it. There's no, nothing to see. Uh, Donsk is, of course, is completely young. First of all, he lives in time. He lives in time in the sense he's, he comments on what's going on. He comments on basically the running commentary. He talks every week. He writes every week. He's productive. He's a, he's a machine, you have to say, like the, how, how he produces text. But he, so he talks, and also he's in time in the sense of history. He, he very, very clearly feels where he is in, in, in this moment in time. Yeah, so I, and I, I, the last thing to contrast these two figures, because I, I, I was just thinking, I thought it's curious that that's how it panned out. Schlogeris is, with Ginto das Majek, is another Lithuanian philosopher called, he's, he's apocalyptic. So it's all doom and gloom. There's nothing, there's no, nothing good can happen. Yeah. Everything that could have happened that was well, he already did. And actually, if you look very well, very closely, it never, nothing good ever happens. Something like that. It's very, very apocalyptic, I think is the right term. And Donsk is, although is, is extremely sensitive, you could even say fragile. So for example, his latest book is called uh, Matskoda, which is, I'm in pain. I'm, I'm, I, I feel pain for, for what's happened. But this is a lot of positivity and optimism about, about his outlook. He's, I think that's, that's something new. So yeah, that I thought I will, I will share these, uh, these uh, comments with you and then I'm happy to discuss. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your time. So, uh, um, only Marcy would like to read the... Oh yeah, okay. So I, yeah, I'll read, maybe I'll stand up and read it since my voice isn't carrying well. Is that helpful a little bit? <laughs> Oh, camera. Oh, where's yeah, the, the camera? Is over there. So where's the just, camera? Just closer to that side. Yeah. Oh, that's it. That's it. <laughs> okay. I don't know where the camera. I don't know where. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the it's camera's over there. there. Okay. Oh, hello, camera. Hello, camera. <laughs> okay. So this is Krzysztof Krzyzewski. This is the eulogy he wrote, you know, immediately following receiving the news of the Rembrandt's death. How is it possible? In that one moment, early in the morning at the Vilnius airport, on the way from Stettene to Petersburg on that Wednesday, the 21st of September, when the world was celebrating the order of the smile and in churches, people joined in a prayer for peace on the anniversary of Virgil's passing and the murder of 1,159 Jewish neighbors by the death commander and Voluchonis near Vilnius. And so in that one moment, everything that was barely the barely just begun future, the getting ready for the flight, the notebook densely filled with things to do lying on the desk, just now placed there with the view of the Nevisius Valley, the meticulously interconnected web of ideas, desires, and dreams stretched upon the horizon of a newly built home so close to Miłosz, like a fisherman who has carefully organized everything during the night so that at dawn he can sail out to sea. And so in that one moment, our common plans for travel to Vienna and beyond, for books written together, for symposia, for the spiritual pedagogical province in the Polish-Lithuanian borderlands, for our Castalia, for which we already laid the foundations, for the building together of invisible bridges, the only real passages to the shores of the other accessible to us. In that one moment, did everything merely become past tense, Leonidas? Your heart stood still, no movement. Many things came to be. You were a writer, a philosopher, a teacher, an engagé intellectual, even a politician. You were an ideal conversation partner, as we discovered more than once in Krasnogruda and reading your dialogues with Bauman or Venslova. You were a builder of moral imagination, the kind of imagination that in the epic of liquid emotionality, give support to love and friendship. 
You were the living testimony of truth. And as history confirms, searching for truth is identical to effectual doing. But our time, Leonidas, is not yet past perfect. I will just remind you how we repeat it to ourselves that this category of time does not exist in the craft of bridge building. Things are no different now that your heart has stopped. There is movement around your heart, Leonidas, movement that will stir it awake, that will continue to wake it and bring it to people without ceasing. There is no you were, there is only you are. And there is only the future imperfect, which after all is the same as the past imperfect for once time is liberated from the burden of necessity, closing us into the finite and past time begins to follow its own rules beyond death. I am pleading there is no you were. The moment entered into the calendar of fate under the date of September 21st changes only one thing, that you will no longer be determined by your sleepless nights, your unwritten books, your restless travels, but by us, your brothers and sisters of this and future generations, through whom will flow the movement of your heart, we who will lay the next stones on the foundations of Castalia, who will translate and publish your work, who will meet in dialogue and deed to continue your search for truth, goodness, and love. This is the moment, Leonidas, when there falls upon us the voice Miwosh heard in a dream, a voice he deciphered as, an order or an appeal in an unearthly tongue, day draw near, another one, do what you can. Thank you, Marcia. Uh, as, you, as you maybe noticed, uh, Bradley had to go. He has some teaching to do. Uh, with this, we would like to close the first part of, uh, of our meeting but there will be a second one after which we will invite you for lunch uh but uh now i would like to just dis dis disseminate some texts to to follow i will i will probably ask uh, marcy if, if she may to to, to introduce and, and and read them and then we will try to discuss it in a, in in, in learning this is spirit uh in some way trying to uh, invoke his voice, which is so much missed uh, nowadays. Uh, I understand that uh, Timothy Snyder needs to go as well, but but uh, I hope uh, you will all stay and, and, and just bear with us some minute while, while we share the text. Okay, quickly. Uh, th thank you, thank you all for, for sharing your, your thoughts. It, it was enlightening and very touching. Okay. Um, I'll, uh, I'll maybe join you here. Hopefully, have a bit of a conversation. Uh, be before, oh, just just leave it as as fine. Uh, before before we start, would, would anyone have a comment or, or a question? Also, those uh, on watching us on Zoom, uh, please uh, write comments in, in 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 the comment box, and we will try to read them as well. Um, and we'll. Give you a moment to, to to take a look at the text. Uh, so, so what is this, Marcy? What is, what, what is this text? <laughs> no, this is a, this is a, a good question. Um, no, and really, I'm, if, if I had been more organized, I would have asked uh, Vladimir Tismaniano to zoom in. Um, so, this this text um, is titled "Demons." Um, and it was from a work in progress that was to be titled Demons, Metapolitics, Nihilism, and Radicalism in a Century of Ideological Passions. And it was an epistolary text that was being written in dialogue, which was really an exchange of letters 
um, with, with Leonidas's friend, our friend, um, Vladimir Tismaniano, um, who is a political philosopher from Romania who has long been based in the States, you know, and <laughs> shares many sensibilities with Leonidas, um, both a deep rootedness in Romanian history, in his own Jewish history, deeply cosmopolitan, um, extremely concerned with the moral implications of all theoretical ideas, preoccupied with the totalitarian catastrophes of the 20th century, constantly vigilant about the present moment, with also with a manic, expansive wave of references. And Vladimir, in fact, writes in a very similar way to the way Leonidas writes. You know, it's it's best to see him in person, kind of manically, enthusiastically, thinking aloud, associating this and that and this and that. Um, but they were they were friends, they were interlocutors, um, and they were exchanging these open letters, which that which by the way is a genre that we really don't have in America. I mean, it's not like they were writing in English to each other as a common language, but it's not an American genre. Like it's definitely it's much more of, of a European and East European genre. It's a genre I love. I love these dialogical forms for various reasons that I won't bore you with. Um, but in any case, they were, this was 2016, um, and they were, you know, in the midst of this when Leonidas died, you know, and so Vladimir sent this to me, and it never got published, um, because it was never finished, you know, and if I had been more organized, I would have asked Vladimir to, to introduce this himself um, via Zoom, he's at the University of Maryland in Washington, um, but I, this came about kind of quickly and I didn't have a chance to, but I'm sure he would not mind our using the material. He's very much a public intellectual and he as general rule always believes in reaching out. Um, so this is from, yeah, this is, is from the beginning of that. And they're both thinking in real time with each other. And you can tell, you can tell that from the text um, and should we read it aloud or what, what I, I think plan? it would be best that we go through it uh, in its entirety no mm -hmm. uh, and, and and just uh, just uh, ha have a quick go through with, uh, together and then uh, maybe maybe get back to different parts of it this way we can focus on the text and then the discussion we will fit as much of it as we can right? just just because of, of a time time limitation but uh, I will also ask to let us know like 10 minutes to half past 12 uh, about the time limitations. Is that okay? Do, do you want me to read it or are people are tired of hearing me read? I can, I can. Uh, is anyone tired of hearing me <laughs> <you? laughs> read? Anyway. I'm pretty sure we're. we're, we're... Okay, so what would, uh, I mean, I had sent this to, to Arvidas as some things I was thinking about. Like one of the reasons I like this, I have a whole stack of you know, various books by Leonidas and English translation on my desk. But one of the reasons I thought to send this to you, even though it was unpublished and unedited, is because it was right before he died. And so I feel like in a way it's the, the most recent thinking or the most kind of up to date you know insight into what was going on in his head at that moment and the thing that prefaces it is just a dear vladimir so you can imagine a kind of you know dear vladimir that it starts and then it kind of continues vladimir answers and it's so timely as, as we will see it. yeah it's extra like when i reread it you know at, at the because of this seminar i found it eerie how timely it, it was. I mean, Leonidas was watching the Maidan very, very closely. I mean, he was following all these things very, very closely. Um, and he was very pressing it. Okay, uh, um, so, dear Vladimir, according to Zygmunt Bauman, and I should say Zygmunt Bauman was one of his most important interlocutors. They co-authored various things together. They were often in dialogue. And in particular, Zygmunt Bauman's idea of liquid modernity which is kind of what he called post-modernity, you know, and the encapsulized version is that he uses the, Bauman uses the metaphor of solids turning into liquids. And he says, if modernity was about an attempt to replace the old solids with new and better solids, then this liquid modernity, this post-modernity, you know, is an attempt to forego the solids completely in favor of liquidity and just embrace this liquidity. 
just embrace this fluidity, you know, and what are the implications of that for better or for worse? And then, you know, Leonidas and Sigmund Bauman spent lots and lots of time, you know, meandering and musing over the implications of this idea of liquid modernity. Okay. So, um, dear Vladimir, according to Sigmund Bauman, present politics have been divorced from power. Nowadays, power runs on its own and politics tries to survive. It no longer explains anything and offers no visions or programs for renewing the world. It only needs ever new waves of fear and moral panic so that certain groups in society could be mobilized in a gigantic ever-growing state machine devoted to surveillance and colonizing and taking over the last vestiges of individual privacy could be justified. A machine that though incompetent, primitive and morally provincial is brutal and technically efficient. Politics cannot do without populism which seems to have become the simplest way out of all modern predicaments. Populism is a skilled and masterful translation of the private into the public with an additional ability to exploit fear to the full. Fear and hatred are twin sisters, as we know quite well. One never walks alone without the other. Yet this time it is not organized hatred, which was something out of Orwell's two minute hate or the seance of collective hysteria and group orgy of hatred orchestrated by the party and practiced in the Soviet Union and other people's democracies. Instead, it is the real fear of a private person elevated to the rank of public concern or sometimes translated even into mass obsession. The question arises as to fear of what? The answer is quite simple. It is fear of someone who comes as personification of our own insecurities and uncertainties, who get their first and last names of facial features due to excessive sensationalist media coverages, tabloid editorials and conspiracy theories, fear of Islam and Muslims, fear of immigrants, fear of gays and lesbians, fear of godless pinkos, fear of new Jewish world conspiracies, fear of Jews and Banderites that is fascist in the way in which Kremlin propaganda depicts them in Ukraine. Together with privacy exposed in the public, fear has become the most precious political commodity. At the same time, it serves as the key to success for every tabloid, for we live in a world of self-generating and self-sustaining fear panic mongering, fake images and information, compulsive self-exposure, constant attention seeking, conspiracy theory, suspicion, hatred, and bullying conflated with critique. This is not to say that courage bid farewell to this world. Ukraine could serve here as the best proof of courage, bravery, sacrifice, willpower, and magnanimity without which the country never would have had the strength to mobilize and defend itself against Russia's aggression and political terrorism. And it becomes the reminder of what it means not to succumb to panic and fear, both being the most desirable outcome for the Kremlin and Vladimir Putin. To find the strength to resist nuclear blackmail, toxic lies and hate crimes committed inside and outside Russia means to be on the winning side nowadays. The more fear we generate in our media, the more success we bring to the Kremlin. William Shakespeare is usually celebrated as the author of his great tragedies, comedies, and historical chronicles. Yet his sonnets reveal Shakespeare as a poet and as a thinker who found a perfect form for his wit and breadth of his thought. His immortal 66 sonnet reads, tired with all these for restful death I cry, as to behold desert a beggar born and needing nothing trimmed in jollity and purest faith unhappily forsworn and gilded honor shamefully misplaced and maided virtue rudely strumpeted and right perfection wrongfully disgraced and strength by limping away disabled and art made tongue tied by authority and folly doctor-like controlling skill and simple truth miscalled simplicity and captive good attending captain ill. Tired with all these, from these would I be gone, save that to die, I leave my love alone. This sonnet is one of the most powerful poetic and moral messages left by the genius from Stratford-upon-Ava. 
it stretch it sounds as a sketch of or as a prologue to Hamlet's monologue, just like Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart's Concerti for piano and orchestra anticipated some arias from Sosi Fan Tutte or Don Giovanni. A serious clue to Shakespeare's political and moral message could be found in Tengiz Abuladze's film Repentance, where the embodiment of evil, Varlam Aravidze, recites Shakespeare's 66 sonnet to his victims, people who are condemned to perish during the purge. The episode where his son, Abel Aravidze, comes to make a confession to the monk who eats the fish and who turns out to be the devil devouring God leaves no place for doubt. Varlam Aravidze reading Shakespeare's sonnet reveals the greatest irony of the devil lecturing on virtue and good. This is to say that evil is not banal. We assume too much after Hannah Arendt's report from Jerusalem, where she depicted Adolf Eichmann as the embodiment of the banality of evil. True, people expected to see the monster, yet what they saw in the court was a colorless bureaucrat of death, a practitioner of the ethics of duty, nearly in the Kantian sense. True, he was far from insane. The bad news was that he was sound and sane. Psychiatrists assured Israel and the world that Eichmann, under any other circumstances, would have made a loving husband and a sweet neighbor. That was, as Arendt thought, the banality of evil. Yet we seem to have assumed too lightly that evil lurks simply in our ability to allow it to pass in full anonymity and impunity only due to our willingness to act as its accomplices. We started taking it for granted, supposing that we all participate in the democratic division of evil these days. What can I say? Yes and no. Or rather, yes, but. Yes, evil lurks in all of us, and it would be naive of us to portray evil as the monster with satanic traits and paraphernalia. Nor is it sound and logical to clinicalize evil as just another word for illness or insanity. But evil is something incomparably more than merely our participation in the division of modern inaction, insensitivity, and mass blunders or follies. And captive good attending captain ill. Evil turns out to be a victorious captain here with good as a captive attending to grace his triumph. And evil shall have the dominion to reverse Dylan Thomas. And good shall praise evil, ascribing to it glory, virtue, bravery, and prowess. And good shall negotiate evil, trying to elevate it to the rank of a major actor, if not the protagonist of world drama. And captive good attending Captain Ill. Evil is about how a seemingly decent person or group becomes a nobody or non-entity, a coward and traitor. Fear is the midwife of evil. George Orwell assisted Shakespeare in portraying evil as our surrender to dehumanizing fear and treachery. Out of his fear that a starving rat would attack his face and mouth, Winston Smith starts yelling, don't do it to me, do it to Julia. Nowadays, it translates into, don't do it to me, do it to Ukraine and Syria. And captive guilt, uh, guilt, good attending captain ill. Evil is about how we are stripped of our language, sensitivity, and memory. If you deny evil, you will be punished, confining you to mental asylum and making you suffer from blocks of memory or lapses of reason. If you evoke evil, you will lose your face, eyes, and physical appearance. Mikhail Bulgakov, another great disciple of Shakespeare, gives us a great lesson about this. And captive good attending captain ill. Evil imposes on us its vocabulary, wording, and phrasing. We are left speechless and thoughtless. The West allows a fascist and terrorist state, Russia, to position itself as an ally in the war on terror, just like the EU negotiates the aggressor, Russia, over implementation of the Minsk Peace Accords, as if to say that Ukraine is bound to take the aggressor as a peace partner. This is evil, and it is far from banal. This is nothing other than captive good attending captain ill. This is just self-inflicted dumbness, numbness, and blindness. Tired with all these, from these would I be gone. Save that to die, I leave my love alone. 
The good news that Shakespeare conveys to us in his plays is that evil will fall prey to itself. Those who are left alive and well will eventually kill the master to switch with him. Yet whether this will turn out lesser or bigger evil is the question worthy of the year 2016, which marks 400 years since the passing of William Shakespeare. It's 2016, a significant time in, in the US as well. Uh, I, I, I thought uh, per, perhaps since, since you, 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 you've, uh, you've familiarized with the text earlier, really, but perhaps you have any uh, instant comments, uh, perhaps a few ideas to share uh, to, to kick things off. I, I can, but I don't have to. Um, <laughs> Maybe I, I'll, I'll share a couple of uh, uh, reactions. Uh, and uh, yeah, just to start off the conversation. One thing is always when I read uh, Leonidas, and I read him with, uh, with great pleasure, of course, but also perhaps that's how I was brought up. You know, you you always try to uh, to attack those whom you respect, so you always look for for you know for the weak spots. And I always with Leonidas, it's always my question to him is always, what do you mean? these days or present or now what when did this when has this present started what what are we talking about did it start in 2014 did it start in what postmodernity so then when is it 1980s or is it 1950s what is this now now we're talking about especially when you talk you make claims like you know about of metaphysical import, like evil. We're talking about evil, and nowadays evil, you know, has gained this form. And I'm, I'm I think it's a big statement. These are big, big uh, words uh, to say. And and uh, yeah, I always, I always. So in this text also there is this. And and again, I will make this um, qualification. We have to keep in mind this is an unpublished text, and this is a. Uh, you know, so you cannot, yeah, yeah, it's a conversation. So, but if we take it seriously, and I think it's still in the spirit of Leonidas, so it, this present or this nowadays, or uh, it's 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 always curious to me because, of course, I'm I'm reading about fear, and which is prominent in this text, and I immediately think about Søren Kierkegaard who is the, the thinker of uh, early 19th century, first half of 19th century. And he writes about anxiety, which we all now know, existential anxiety, blah, 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 which existentialists started talking about mid 20th century. They took it from Heidegger, but Heidegger took it from Kierkegaard. And Kierkegaard says that anxiety, which in his qualification is fear of nothing, fear of without an object, which is kind of precisely what Leonidas is talking about, yeah? We have fear of what? We don't know yet. And then it has to be somehow personified. Yeah? Personified. Yeah? Yeah. Well, uh, and then I'm thinking, so there's uh, uh, Kierkegaard's um, uh, account that, is it valid in this or no? But I don't know because I don't have the frame time here. Uh, the time frame, sorry, in, in, in this text. Kierkegaard, he says that that's uh, this, the problem of anxiety arises in modern times, but he's specific. It's because it's secular. We do not have a meaningful notion Measure. of God, and that's why we lack structure. That's his answer. You can disagree with it, but that's the answer. And then you have the time frame when it started, and then you can start talking about it. And also, he, he makes a very, very uh, important connection between anxiety and freedom. Uh, so I would bring this in, but I'm not sure if I allow. Of course you're allowed. Of course, yeah. allowed. Well, in the sense, if it's, uh, uh, um, I'm not, if I'm allowed in, in, in Leonidas' interpretation. Uh, and another thing which I wanted to say, which is not about Kierkegaard, but uh, about uh, uh, Jack London, uh, great American writer. Uh, and in his novel, uh, Sea Wolf, in the English sea wolf. There's this uh, story uh, about 
kind of an intellectual, uh, fragile person who turns up at this uh, fisherman's boat and meets this guy, really kind of masculine, brash, uh, Wolf Larsen. Uh, and they kind of polar opposites. One is very <coughs> physical, masculine, uh, and uh, yeah, really kind of strong personality. And, 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 and the other guy, Humphrey, I think his name is, um, he's kind of this intellectual from, San Francisco. I don't know from where. It doesn't matter. But uh, but uh, there is this great great scene in the, in the novel where the ship is attacked by some uh, other guys, and uh, this intellectual guy he's afraid, and his knees are trembling, and this Wolf Larsen captain of the ship, he points at his knees and says, "Oh, you are afraid, a coward," and then this guy intellectual he makes a great comeback. He says. No, no, he says, you don't have fear. And that's why you're not afraid. You, you, don't, you, are, you are not brave. He says, I am afraid. My body is afraid. And I'm still here. That's real uh, braveness. That's mm -hmm. real. Uh, and I thought, I'm reading this. Mm -hmm. I was thinking uh, that to be brave is a function of fear. You have to have fear in order to be able to be brave. I think it's, uh, it's uh, you know, if you do not have any fear, there's some psychopathology, you, you know, it's, it, there's something wrong with you mentally. Well, uh, a, a lot of, uh, sorry, to just to jump in on that, you, 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 a lot of Ukrainian soldiers, when asked if, uh, if they're not afraid, uh, tend to say that phrase that uh, if you're not afraid, you're stupid. Uh, exactly. But brave, bravery is, exactly. is courage is the yeah. word. Yeah. So courage is that. That's what I thought about when when Lenita says. So it doesn't mean that courage disappeared from this world. And I thought correct. I agree completely. But then I thought, but actually, courage is only possible because there's fear. Mm -hmm. Courage is a function of fear. You can be courageous only because you have fear, and, and you conquer it. You that's must... that's how courage. Uh, Emerges in a sense, it it gives us also a positive project to look look to when when we read uh, this 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 text. I was wondering uh, because uh, Donskis would have liked really to to involve everyone, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, not, so that it's not just mm -hmm. us having a conversation, but everyone uh, would. So if he, anyone would like to share their their thoughts or or, or comments, uh, you're very welcome. Um, Oh, yeah, yeah, please. Um, once there's a conversation starting, uh, looming about fear, then like also, well, this, uh, this courage is not the absence of fear. That is like a well-known saying, and it's also attributed to Nelson Mandela, Mandela who said that uh, courage is uh, a way of kind of winning over fear, so that courage and fear are um, always related. But I'm also thinking of, uh, in these terms, uh, the the question the, this question about courage and uh, I have or have been re recently rereading Mars's book the Ukrainian Night mm -hmm. and in this book you write about like the people you met and the mm -hmm. stories how they came to go to Maidan mm -hmm. and like through these stories uh, I think there these um, this the question of courage and fear it comes uh, to the foreground very like very clearly and it's very important part of your your book about Maidan and also I'm thinking of the like the conversation I, I have had with my uh, Ukrainian friends and like like I'm I'm really like uh, sorry to say that I'm one of those people who has now more you know Ukrainians I communicate with I have been become more active since February 2022. Uh, it's, a, it's a shame, but that's how it is. But we discuss also with them about this, where your courage come from. And it is also kind of, how to say, in the most kind of real everyday sense, it is this overcoming your fear and becoming courageous like this. But I think also in, in your book, in the stories about people, how they end up in Maidan, there is also um, like the, there you can also think differently about that it's also maybe the fear doesn't come in at certain moments and it is also about this question that how can we change how can we um change our perspective toward evil if it needs to so something very decisive very extreme to happen is it possible you know living just your comfortable everyday life to really 
change to really become more attentive, to really become more courageous, or it somehow it is in the human nature that we can't. Yeah. Do, do we need a war to be courageous? Yeah. Right? yeah. I, I would uh, slightly shift this uh, question or, or, or comment to a point uh, what, what, uh, that, that uh, Leonidas also makes uh, about you know, encountering uh, this otherness in, in, in the political environment. So maybe not in the comfort of your home can you, you be courageous, but does it require courage to meet uh, you know, people that are different to you in your own society to meet them? With, with with this you know eye to eye straight uh, straight encounter uh, is, can we count that as courage and what kind of fear is that fear of what there I mean, one thing if I can generalize about Leonidas and I was not the person who knew him the best and I, I knew him for only in the last ten years of his life but, and this may be a stereotypical Jewish thing but he he really, he understood anxiety. Like <laughs> going back, like, I mean, anxiety was real to him, you know? And a lot of the work that he does on conspiracy theory and populism, you know, and totalitarianism and political pathology goes back to taking anxiety seriously, you know, and trying to see how anxiety is distorted or its object obscured, you know, or what Freud would call displaced, you know, onto different objects. So like that, what, what Heidegger takes from, from Kierkegaard, I think Victor is, is talking about is this, this radical distinction between, you know, what, what Heidegger calls angst, you know, and fear. And he said, you know, angst, and this is what, what Victor mentions, that the thing about angst is that it's a fear, fear is fear of something. It's transitive, it takes an object. Like I, I'm deathly afraid of snakes. It's very specific, there's an object. It doesn't actually come from a real encounter with a snake, but there's, there is a thing that you are afraid of. You're afraid of airplanes, you're afraid of bombs, you're afraid of snakes, you're afraid of spiders, you're afraid of dragons. Like there's a thing you're afraid of. Whereas Heidegger says the thing about angst is it is what is threatening is, is nothing. It comes from nowhere, you know, and for Heidegger, that's like plays into our existential condition and the fact that we're always sine sub toto, we're being towards death and that, you know, in the end, we're like, we're afraid of the fact that being in the world is the fact that we're moving towards nothingness and this nothingness is threatening. Um, but this distinction then that like the angst often gets translated into anxiety, sometimes as dread um, in English. And then we don't, you know, normally, unless we're, you know, talking about Heidegger and Kierkegaard, make this clear distinction between anxiety and fear, but which is, which is clearly important, like it's important for Heidegger and Kierkegaard, but it's also kind of important for what Leonidas is talking about here, where he, he also, he has great analyses of Protocols of the Elders of Zion, you know, and the return of modern conspiracy theories, and this kind of projection that he mentions here of our own anxieties onto the other. So it's not nothing. It doesn't come from nowhere. Like the anxiety is real. Mm -hmm. The anxiety is real. Like, and it's in some ways it should be respected that we have it, that it has to be dealt with. But it gets projected onto objects which are not actually the source of the anxiety, but are the projections of our anxiety. And that this results in a certain political pathology. And there's something there that is both, I would say it's, it's very sober in that he doesn't pretend that there is a world in which anxiety and fear could be eliminated in some magical way. There's no utopian moment, but there is a kind of, you know, epistemological optimism that, which is almost kind of Kantian, that like with better understanding, you know, we could alleviate, you know, some of these perversions and some of these distortions that, engender evil and cruelty in the world, you know, in which we are then kind of lashing out and victimizing, you know, those onto whom our anxiety is projected. You know, my, uh, my mother, who's an art historian, uh, mm -hmm. likes to say that uh, if you want to destroy a piece of art, analyze it. <laughs> so, but I, I, I suppose this this thing works for for, yeah. <laughs> for projections of fear as well, uh, sort of uh, analysis with uh, with thought with mm. with mind. Um, 
But I was th thinking of another source of projections that that Leonidas also mentions is, is the media, and and, and he talks about uh, this uh, power being separated from politics. And my understanding of of uh, Leonidas's understanding of politics is that it's a meeting of minds. It's a meeting of uh, opposite. Uh, uh, th uh, thought points or put positions and some somehow intelligent finding an intelligent uh, mm -hmm. uh, sort of solution and, and 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 coming to some sort of agreement so you know quite this liberal democratic way uh, this is what politics is as opposed to perhaps a conflict of interest or uh, just a conflict of interest or power play or, or something like that so I'm reading uh, Donsky's in, in that sense and then I'm uh, and, and then uh, I, I read that he says uh, Power has been separated from politics, or politics separated from power, and that uh, we no longer need this political conversation to have pol uh, po uh, to have power or what well, power in in the public, and and uh, he sort of suggests media taking over uh, that 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 that. Uh, that space. Uh, so, in terms of projections, well, we could think of uh, you know the the information bubbles that, that, that we're in. That we have our little power politics uh, without the conversation. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. If I could uh, jump in here again, my problem is, of course, uh, with the sentence "present politics has been divorced from power." Mm -hmm. What do you mean by present? Mm -hmm. And it, it, because it also implies that there has been a time when politics were not divorced from power. <laughs> Please name, I wanna go back to this golden age. Uh, so that, that's where I kind of stop. I think th there is this tendency and it's human tendency, Not and philosophers are human beings too, unfortunately. But this uh, human tendency to, to think that I live in a unique time, that this time is special. And then, so you take it as, a, as an assumption, and then you start making a list what is unique about it. And I think that there's this, um, it's a trap. It's a trap because you start, everything becomes a validation of this assumption. But if you ask yourself, maybe it's not a unique time. Maybe it's not. Maybe there's nothing fundamentally new. Humans, did they change? Have they changed human nature? As far as I'm concerned, no. It hasn't. Is politics part of human realm? That's what we did. Yes, it is. So I have to be very, very careful when I say, oh, now fundamentally things have changed. Because it it you know it's it's it becomes these statements, but they become self-validate. And that's that's my issue here. I'm thinking because if I say, okay, present, so not only present, yeah. So maybe we didn't we ha we haven't had the time when politics yeah. and power were together. Mm -hmm. But then there is already a possibility that maybe it's impossible. Maybe we shouldn't even talk about it. Maybe our idea of what power and politics should be is wrong. That's already a possibility. But if you imply that it is possible because it has been, then you have to make an argument. And that, I, for me, it's, it's lacking. Because if you read last 70 years at least, political philosophers in the West, every decade, they will say, everything has gone horribly wrong. But first it's radio, then it's TV, <laughs> then it's uh, internet, then it's Facebook, Twitter, etc. So every decade, some new media turns up and now it's definitely horribly wrong. <laughs> Maybe it hasn't. Maybe we just, you know, we, we just um, make this assumption and these facts of life, they just become validators of these assumptions. That That's what I'm thinking of while reading this. Re retrospective argumentation. In this kind case. of, yes. Uh, but I, uh, I, I would uh, suggest that uh, perhaps a project, uh, so uh, so we perhaps we cannot speak of, you know, politics being there in the, in the Donskian mm -hmm. sense uh, at some uh, historical time, but a project towards that. Uh, the part of what Leonidas uh, was, and in a sense, uh, what European Union was was supposed to, to, to have people uh, talk. And we know the reality, but but uh, I mean the, the intention of that, uh, and this sort of liberal democratic uh, intention in, in in pursuing the, the, the politics in, in in the West at least, but globally as well after the nineties. 
uh, that you, you could say that that was uh, an epoch, uh, the spirit, uh, the spirit of times in which uh, the effort was made. I'm not saying it was the case here. Uh, perhaps he's talking about that. And are we past this time? What 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 does the audience think? Are we past past the liberal dream of politics? The young people here. <laughs> How do you feel? You're just coming of age. Yeah. If it already hit, have you missed the whole thing? You're interested in totalitarian <laughs> uh, march? I think, um, and I think in the latest collection of Leonardo's book, Manscoda, and in his previous writings on nationalism and national identity, I think there always comes this tension between the public and private sphere, or how. Um, how something um, individual and collective rights have to come into one. And I think that's the inherent tension between liberalism that kind of promotes the individual rights and it, it, um, your own little sphere of, um, uh, uh, of, 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 of existence. And then you have a collective and how you reconcile those two. And I think uh, it's, it's, and, Kind of bringing to your point, is it to Victor's point? Is it a unique, a unique moment, or is the world transforming in such a way that we cannot can can no longer recognize that it's one of its kind? And I think I, I can see a lot of this concern in the last writings of Menendez. How and he talks a lot about social media, and he talks a lot about the loss of human connection or a loss of secrecy, but secrecy in a good sense, like something very special that only two pe people share. Uniqueness maybe. Yeah, uh, and the, but then I also think doesn't, doesn't courage or fear take in a, inherently in a public place? Like don't we meet the other in the public place? And that that's what shapes the politics or that's what shapes the um the reality so um maybe uh, I'm, I'm sorry if it's not very coherent but um i guess my my, my question or, or or the feeling that i have is how important is the private sphere how how important is it in 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 in, in, in the world and is and, and i think if we take linda's idea uh, as i would have said that it's meeting of ideas or encounter of ideas, isn't that inherently public? And I think that's, um, I think maybe that's the, the, the level on which um, it would be uh, I don't know, productive to think about ideas. If I, if I can add to that, I guess a question for both of the actual like the Lithuanians who remembered, you know, the time during I mean, Leonidas's life, uh, you know, who were following him in Lithuanian as well. Because one thing that struck me about him is that for somebody who was a, a philosopher, very attentive to and sensitive to both postmodernity as it comes up through the 70s and 80s, but also the particular, you know, the particular risk, you know, and threat of the transparency that's come with the internet, you know, and a theorist, as someone who's constantly thinking about the philosophical implications of social media and the dark side of social media, of all those. Of all the people, of, of you know, of the serious thinkers who have been talking about that, who I happen to know, Leonidas anecdotally strikes me as the person who himself was most comfortable in that media space. You know, he when he was a representative to to Brussels, I, mean, I think he intentionally was very very public on that Facebook page. He wanted as much transparency as possible. That was part of his idea of democracy was that if you are representing people, they should know what's going on, they should know what you're thinking. He was very performative. You know, he liked being on television. I mean, most of us who are academics and learn to give lectures, like we we get more comfortable with it. But he was really like, he really loved it. Like, he, you know, he loved playing the guitar. He loved acting. He loved like, like he enjoyed being in that media space. And so the, I, I'm curious as to how, you know, in his own language where he was most in the media space, how that played out between being a, a critic of a dark side of transparency and somebody who was unusually comfortable with it. 
I just want to add because just to, to, to give an idea of how omnipresent Donskis was in <laughs> Lithuanian public life. So, so he has a TV show weekly. He has a weekly column, TV show, national TV. This is not just random, national TV, weekly show. Then he has a weekly column uh, on the, the most popular website in Lithuania. Then he pops up uh, at uh, Santra Shvesa, which is a kind of intellectual movement, very in influential kind of liberal minded people. Then, so that's kind of, okay, that's expected. But then you switch on uh, soccer. And there he's commentating soccer <laughs> because he loves soccer and he knows, uh, and he loves Netherlands, uh, Cruyff, etc., etc. And then you go uh, in Clayford on public transport, and there he, his voice announcing the bus stops <laughs> because the, someone offered him, and he's like, I love it. And so, so he's everywhere. Uh, he is really is, and he's very comfortable with attention, mm -hmm. he, at least publicly. You never know private anxieties, etc. I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, I can't even say, I can't even comment, but he looks extremely comfortable. He you can't say that he, in the sense that he's enjoying it in, in the narcissist, but he's extremely, you would say media savvy yeah. in the sense that he knows how this works. Uh, but I think uh, uh, just to answer, at least to provide a hypothetical answer to Mars's uh, question, but I think that's, uh, you know, that expertise is precisely what allows him to, to comment on, uh, you know, on perhaps not so positive aspects yeah. of, of, of this, uh, of this life, so in in that sense, for, for me there is no contradiction. You kind of you, you you look at it as an instrument of your your profession of your professional life, but also you see that it has it has certain limitations. It has effects on you, and in that sense, you can say I, I will say what I just criticized. I will say <laughs> nowadays, <laughs> nowadays, of course, the social media it makes you you know present 24 hours, you, you you do not switch off because it does not switch off. It's not, so in that sense, uh, I think uh, it, it brings its own its own pressures uh, to to what he used to do. And I think he's, he, he started commenting on that. Uh, yeah. I didn't know he did soccer as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah he, it, he was not the, it was not the professional right, right. thing, but he was a guest commentator and I think on FIFA World Cup. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Please. yeah, thank you so much. Um, my name is Susan Boschich. I'm uh, one of the visiting scholars here as well. Um, I have to admit, I'm absolutely not in philosophy. I'm a sociologist, and here I'm more on the political and empirical side and uh, not on the rather theoretical side. But what I find extremely interesting here is that that I mean, coming coming myself from the uh, from research on the decline of democracies, um, the hybrid democracies, de-democratization, etc., also resilience of democracy and non-resilience. Uh, what I find extremely interesting here is that he obviously speaks about the polarization that is based on the politics of fear and on anxiety, and I think that this is the important maybe also take away from this text what, so how, how we can understand what is going on in particular in Europe right now, because um, I think that one part, one problem of democracies is that we are even, we have fear to recognize the success of the politics of fear and the politics of anxiety. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? For example, in Germany, uh, where, where I live and, and come from, we have huge problems really to accept, to recognize that we have a party since a couple of years who is working with the polarization and with this huge making their politics and their, their, all their, their public statements only based on anxiety. Uh, they get up to 30% of the votes today uh, in some parts of the countries and they're absolutely fascist. They're not even right wing, they're fascist. And this is the same problem also based on the international system with Russia. So no one, I mean, I, I'm absolutely astonished that, that even in 2016, he was so clear to say that we, this is a fascist regime, which you could have never said anywhere in Europe in 2016, mm -hmm. that Russia is a fascist regime. <gasps> no way, no, probably it's even authoritarian today. So this was how people were speaking in, in Europe. And even today, it's difficult to say that. So most people won't accept. So the power of anxiety is something 
that, of course, the populists and the extremists know very well, and they can use it because populism is something that is that is deeply rooted in democracy. So the readings of Margaret Canavan, for example, who was a researcher on, on populism, made that very clear that the more transparent, the more democratic a system is, the more people want to participate, the more they learn, the more they see the complexity and, of course, the ambivalences of democracy, and the more they are um, they, they can they can be or the, the more they are maybe um, they can they can be got by this anxiety politics. So because they see the ambivalences, they are maybe disappointed because of well there are ambivalences, there are things they don't understand, or it's transparent here and maybe not transparent there and so on. And this power of the politics of anxiety is for me maybe the, the, the most important takeaway here because mm -hmm. this helps us really to understand what's going on in particular in Europe. And again, I'm, I'm not an expert in philosophy, but also not in politics in the United States, but I have the impression that there is a story here as well. Like that. Yeah, I, I think just to, to, to bring what's being said together a little bit, uh, I, I would like to continue with that uh, notion perhaps of a paradox, necessary paradox in, in, in politics that we encounter. Well, we talked about one, uh, how fear gives preconditions to, to courage. We had this uh, uh, idea of, of uh, the need of meeting of minds, but also meeting the difference in order to have a political uh, discourse. We, we have a question on when is now uh, and on, on, on that, I, I, I would think that actually Donsk is, uh, might be not talking historically. I, I think he, he, he's talking problematically as a, 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 on, a, on a condition that you can encounter in many historical times, such as Shakespearean time or, 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 or others. That, that, that could be some sort of a, a, a solution, just a situation that we, get, uh, we people get into sometimes, you know, that, that kind of yeah. nowness. Um, and, and, and then we, we have the, 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 some sort of dialectics of evil where, where he relates it to fear and uh, to fear, uh, to lack of, of uh, adequate reaction to this fear or to the, to the evil that's being done or to, to uh, things that uh, are, are uh, so in a sense, uh, reaction, uh, lack of reaction to fear, but also uh, when that uh, fear overtakes and, and evil takes place, a uh, reaction to that. Uh, so, but he criticizes uh, the passive nature of, uh, of, uh, of evil, which is, I think also is important. And, and he says that evil is actually uh, in, uh, proactive in appeasing, and you can, you can almost, succumb, it's, it's within us all potentially, and you, you can succumb to, to that. Uh, through appeasement of evil, through fear and meekness, uh, through losing one's own backbone to, uh, and, and identity, through collaborating, uh, compromising with villainy. Uh, in a sense, it, 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 it all relates to fear, but also, um, you know, it's, it's in another paradox with the necessity of, of having politics. You know, so, so if, if there's an evil actor <laughs> or actor bringing evil, uh, then it needs to be accommodated and dealt with in a political manner uh, uh, in order for fear to triumph. So, so, so how do we reconcile these, these, uh, these paradoxes? Can, can we accept paradox or should we you know, have a strong program of, of, uh, of absolute courage without the traces of fear? You know? <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? Or th did that make sense? Because I tried to <laughs> sort of <laughs> collate too much maybe. Is it like anxiety or it's fear of change or like it's fear of something new mm -hmm. rather than anxiety? Anxiety is like of nothing, mm -hmm. but I think like it seems that it's a fear like of like a change. If your life doesn't change, if you will like have the banality of your life. Like what would you be afraid of? Like what would you be anxious of? An insecurity. Or fear of other. But why would you be afraid if your life is like regular? Like you, but if you know something new and like unexpected, unfamiliar for you, 
then like as others, like they're unfamiliar for you, like then you will be afraid. So, yeah, I, I don't have an answer for you, but I have with, with Kierkegaard, I think would say, <laughs> so I have this, this uh, security bank. Uh, Kierkegaard would say that uh, anxiety emerges out of the uh, infinity of possibilities which are in front of you as an individual. That's why it's directly linked to freedom, to individual freedom. When you are free, you become anxious because you have an infinite array of possibilities or what nowadays we call choices. No, that's that's what we all after. We need choices, but then we are when we are presented with them, we become anxious. Why? Because of course, inevitably, we will make a wrong one. We will make a wrong choice, and then what we will have, of course, is the problem of our conscience. We will be thinking, "What the hell have I done?" So that's the structure in Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard might be wrong, as as uh, most of the philosophers, but at least it gives us a conceptual framework. And what I think Marcy explained very well, if we continue with this conceptual framework, is that, of course, we don't want to stay in this indefinite state of anxiety. That's why we look for the object of this uneasiness. Yeah, we look, so why, why? Yeah, this is the guy, yeah, or that group. This is the, the, the problem. So you kind of channel that uneasiness with your own freedom because you need to delineate yourself. You are afraid of that freedom in the sense that it will, it will just blow you up from the inside. And that's what happens. And to designate some other than yourself is a form of delineation that gives you certain identity. So you say, that's me and that's not me. I know at least that I'm here. That's why. I, Jewish, Blacks, uh, Muslims, whoever. These are the guys who are not me. Yeah? And, and of course, these are all in quotation marks just as, as, as examples. Uh, so I think that's the structure. I'm, I'm not trying to sell it to you in the sense that this is the right answer, but I think this is a possible conceptual framework. And I think, I'm not sure what Leonidas would say, would he agree or and that's, but I think it, from what he wrote, it's applicable. For me, when I read, I have no problem except what I said, I'm not sure about the framework. So let's say within Kierkegaardian framework, this is modernity. This is what, and modernity in the sense that it has become a secular society. Before secular society, we have some reference point. We have a reference point, transcendent uh, divine being. We have lost that. And Kierkegaard's conclusion is that's what, makes us lost beings. It gives birth to anxiety. It's yes, essential. Yes, yes. We are on our own in, in, in this universe. And, so, and, yeah. and then we're set to do our own politics, right? Uh, so yeah. that, then, then we originate the, the goodness and the evil inside of us. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, uh, how, how else? I think Kierkegaard is totally right about that, by the way. And that it plays into a lot of what Leonidas and Sigrid Bauman were talking about in this liquid modernity. Like, okay, now we have multiple meanings. Now we have multiple authorities. Well, that effectively is no authority. Like if you have multiple authorities, that's effectively no authority. There's no, there's no grounding point. Everything just kind of moves around, which is also very anxiety provoking. And I'm very, like, I'm very empathetic to Kierkegaard, you know, in, in general, because I do feel like this, I see why, like, I, I see why the fascists and I see why the like the populists can be compelling in offering that liberation from choice in offering that liberation from thinking somebody else is telling you what to think because the infinite variety of like you can Google this and there are 26,000 you know different kinds of shoes that you can buy that also have you know red heels and like and blue bows or it, it's it's exhausting I mean there is a kind like that the constant choice making and the constant mm. thinking for yourself is exhausting. I, I'll give you a slightly like a slightly embarrassing personal example, but it might be that is like I have this little obsession with going to these indoor cycling classes, which is a, a constant negotiation with with Tim, my husband, because it's somebody has to be home with the kids like at the time that the indoor cycling class is. And 
you can go ride the bike at the gym anytime you want. Like, I don't actually need to be in a class with somebody else shouting at me, like what the instructions are. Um, obviously, like I could think of like when to speed up and when to slow down by myself for an hour. But, but I find it so mentally relaxing to have somebody else shout at me that like, now you stand up, now you sit down, like now you turn the knob to the right, now you turn the resistance to the left. It's a very limited set of instructions because you're on an indoor bicycle. There's not that much you can do. You can stand up, sit down, faster, slower. You can turn the resistance to the right or left. That's basically it. But I still find it like such a nice mental break that somebody else makes the decisions. There's a whole hour where somebody else makes the decisions, even though they're insignificant decisions, but it's still an hour of somebody else making the decisions. You know, and I find that that's just very calming for me, mm -hmm. like in a way that it's not calming if I ride the bike myself. Mm -hmm. I don't think there are three people. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of directly directly related to what you're saying. Hi, my name is Lauren. Um, and I I think it's really to me it's very significant. This I was surprised to suddenly see this beautiful you know, sonnet in the middle of this essay. <laughs> And I'm, I'm so, it's so tantalizing that it's unfinished and, you know, what, what was coming afterwards. And I, I thought, you know, it's interesting, the particular, um, the particular line that he's focusing on, the, the good attending to, have a good containing to Captain Hill. Um, when, when I read the poem and, and heard it read, what it really struck me that it's, it's a love poem. You know, the, to me, the most significant line is the last line and thinking about living in this culture, society, politics, where like, you know, I really, I don't know, thinking about 2016, I was in Poland actually, and that's when I found out that actually saw, was watching the election returns, very surprised that Trump was elected. And I had this, you know, thinking about 2016, all the things we're discussing, you know, this poem, <laughs> kind of reminds me how I felt in that moment of, okay, everything is going wrong. Everything is <laughs> failing. It's basically the end of the world. I remember it was, of course, November, but I remember um, I was watching the election uh, in the, um, there was a, like an event at the embassy to watch the American embassy to watch the, the election. And I remember we came out in, in the morning and it was snowing in November. And it was just this Ooh. kind of like, every, like the world is, is, you know, uh, ending basically, but you know, that what Shakespeare says at the end of this poem is, you know, there, um, there's something that someone that he loves, you know, the speaker that, um, is a reason to continue amid all of this exhaustion. And maybe it comes from the too many choices. Maybe it comes from anxiety, but like, I wonder, you know, for for um, Leonidas, I'm just learning about him through this event and, and this wonderful discussion. But um, I wonder, you know, how would he or how would we like interpret that line in the context of all of this? It's 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 an argument that there's something. Yes, we can analyze all the anxiety and all of these things, but but what is that thing that we love or those people who we love that makes us makes none of it matter actually like mm -hmm. that's a very positive proposal to me is okay fine I'm exhausted fine I don't want to live but here's why and I think in this environment of this exhaustion all, all of these things that we're talking about anxiety sometimes it's hard to artic articulate like why 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 vote like why you know I mean I, I, I'm not talking about myself but we have problems it's just apathy basically and maybe it's that articulation of you know what is that thing that we are living for, or that that we love? Um, I love I love this poem in the, the context of this entire conversation. So. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because one of the things I was I was thinking of, and one of the one of the many ways in which Leonidas is so early death was tragic was that he always struck me as somebody who took deep pleasure in living, like despite his you know acute sensitivity to the horrors of the world and his constant engagement and refusal to turn away with, from them. There was a lot of love and a lot of pleasure. Like, I mean, he loved music. He loved playing the guitar. He loved talking to students. Um, he really loved his wife. <laughs> like, he, like, I mean, she was, you know, his, like, that was a really special relationship. I mean, like, we hope everyone loves their wives, but like there was, I mean, Yolanda was really important 
to Leonidas us get a different way and their life together and the life they had created together, you know, and there was something magical about that for him. I and mean, he was somebody for whom like there really was a lot of love, you know, and like he, like somebody like that should really live a long time because he was really taking despite everything, a lot of pleasure in living. I, I think uh, here Leonidas uh, also read, reads that last line as, uh, you know, an eventual disappearance of evil or, or overcoming of that evil. And then he himself finishes uh, with, you know, whether uh, that sort of revolution uh, of, of uh, non-evil, I don't say good, I, I say non-evil <laughs> versus evil. Uh, is indeed for the better. That's that 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 that, that he also questions. So I, I think that's a, that's a good open question. That, yeah, I mean, I think that. that maybe it's that that part that feels a little bit unfinished to me. That it, it yeah. you know, and and maybe there maybe there is. I mean, I would guess that there is something more coming mm -hmm. there. Um, that it's not just relating that line to to you know evil falling prey to itself, but something more. So that's for us to <laughs> figure out. Okay. Okay, I think we're uh, more or less uh, getting out of time uh, for, for this discussion. But before we, we close, I would like to suggest to just think for, for a few seconds uh, and, and perhaps come up with one phrase or word that kind of can summarize this, uh, this conversation and, and share with us. Maybe that, that, that could be a good, good finishing point. Uh, how about we take like 10 seconds or, or, or 20 minutes? <laughs> oh, we, we have some oh, 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 sorry, oh, Jesus, we, we had a, yeah, sorry, we had a, yeah. Um, um, yes. Actually, I wanted to share some insights from uh, maybe Jewish studies uh, to illuminate some aspects of uh, Gonski's thought, also related to our discussion. But maybe this is worthy of other uh, discussion, other day. And uh, I can share only one uh, idea. Um, I read uh, this other book, not uh, of Gonski's and um, Hatred. Um, and freedom and identity to the box. And it's very interesting that uh, a person who wrote this preface to this book, Timo Araksinen, uh, he said a strange uh, sentence that uh, he maybe even dislikes uh, um, this um, Donsky's view that radical evil exists. But indeed, uh, if uh, we look into the whole work of Donsky's, Actually, he is a spokesman uh, for liberal uh, for liberal view. He criticizes even the Lithuanian uh, uh, philosophy of culture uh, from this standpoint. And then it's very paradoxical. Uh, liberalism has nothing to do with the idea that uh, radical evil exists. Uh, this sentence actually uh, is maybe suggests to all these conspiracy theories, all these bad things, fakes, and so on. Uh, you were speaking uh, about now, nowadays, Germany. How then can it be reconciled uh, to his uh, uh, persistence in this idea? Radical evil exists. And that was exactly the idea uh, Mercy uh, presented us today. Radical evil exists. Mm -hmm. And coming back to uh, what you said, Victor, us, that Schlogeris was an uh, apocalypticist. Apocalyptic thought, yes. Yeah. That's not my idea, but yeah. Uh, Donsky's not. I would suggest another idea that, oh, yes, but um, Donsky's was uh, tended to this eschatological thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, he recognized that radical evil exists. Mm -hmm. It's not a liberal idea. Um, what, yes, mm -hmm. um, we, ha we have to find strategies to recognize this radical evil and to fight it. And uh, maybe uh, even um, Donsky's reflections, what does it mean to be Jewish? Um, maybe an answer to this question, but it would <laughs> require more time to discuss it. Um, but the seriousness of uh, uh, eschatology is very important. And then I, I came to the question, what are the sources of this strange eschatologies, eschatology by Donskis? 
um, interestingly enough, you mentioned Shakespeare, but uh, you uh, didn't continue to discuss uh, Bulgakov's role because uh, um, Donsky is, is quoting Bolt, yeah. Bolt uh, and he uh, says that um, Bulgakov was a dis good disciple of Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this uh, work of Bulgakov, he's also love and also for uh, eschatological things. So I think maybe there are some, uh, mm, um, yeah, suggestions how to continue with discussion because we have no, cannot to finish it today. We only no, are starting. It remains open, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Beth. Okay. Um, so, any any finalizing thoughts to take away, or a word, or a concept that, that... maybe I'll I'll, I'll yeah, I don't, yeah, yeah, I don't yeah, have yeah, anything. But before uh, Iveta spoke, and that was extremely interesting. I I want to start another discussion immediately. <laughs> <laughs> But before I read uh, uh, spoke, I, I was just I just picked up uh, what you just said about uh, Shakespeare, and I thought you know that it's a love sonnet that he quotes, uh, and it's very very risky and almost pathetic in the academic uh, uh, setting to talk about love. But so I'm aware of that. But it seems that you know that uh, this is the uh, direction in which uh, we have to go. I really wanted today to mention another uh, Jewish Lithuanian thinker, uh, Manuel Levinas, who, who um, spoke about you know the uh, responsibility for the other, and I think it's or the other person, not just for some, uh, not just. Abstract Kantian responsibility, but precisely for about responsibility for the other person. And I think this is the direction in which in which uh, uh, we could travel. I'm not saying we should, but I think it's a it's a productive avenue. So that that's the thought which I wanted to put on the table. Question. Yeah. Uh, yes, I would just add to that in thinking about the sonnet that. You're right that like you know, like you know Leonidas is someone for whom like evil evil had an ontological reality to it. It wasn't just a matter of kind of postmodern relativism. Like there was such a thing as an ontological distinction between truth and lies. There's an ontological distinction between good and evil. And in some ways, his his love for thinking, you know, was was a kind of way to an antidote for that. Um, if there was any antidote for that, like it was you fought evil through thinking and it was you know it was work but there was also pleasure and there was a deep love in that engagement you know that was something like he brought to the room you know this sense of like he was there and he was there with you and he was a very busy person he was giving you his time but he also loved it like he loved that thinking aloud you know, he loved remembering Bulgakov and then Shakespeare, you know, and then Chekhov, you know, you know, and Balzac and that he like, like there was, you know, there was that spark about it, you know, and, and without that, everything falls flat. You know, there was that, um, and that was a, that was an ongoing process. You know, that was something with, there wasn't, a, there wasn't a telos at the end, but it was, and in that sense, there was a kind of, you know, it wasn't so anti-postmodern, but it was the, the process that you engaged in, you know, that that had its own value and that could go somewhere good. Anyone else would, would like to share what what word, phrase, idea are you, are you taking from this with you? I have a word, but I think it would lead to another hour's discussion. So I won't say it. That's a secret oh, word. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, we, we will, we, we will have lunch. I came across, and it's kind of on the negative side. Politics is a succession of temporary and partial remedies of permanent and recurring human evil. That's it.
Okay. So, so it's a proactive, continuous work uh, that has to be loved, uh, and and love is, uh, is 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 the work to 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 finish it. I I think that's a wonderful. Mm -hmm. Uh, wonderful finishing. Um, uh, from from my uh, uh, my own end, uh, I will quickly say that I, I only met uh, Leonidas once uh, in this conference in Italy. Uh, we shared some wine, we shared some talks and dinner. Uh, we shared love for life, and uh, uh, what he the impression he left me with, and uh, the, the impression that I, I I'm leaving here with is. Uh, uh, the importance of heart uh, and heart has a relation to love of course to life to uh, courage to courage uh, to charisma uh, to charity uh, and uh, in chinese thought uh, it's the organ of thought and uh, and uh, the symbol of uh, 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 Leo, Leonidas, his heart as well. Uh, 